everyone, and welcome to the Presidencies of the United States. I'm your host, Jerry Landry. This is the first in our series of episodes on our first president, George Washington. Just a note before we begin, the pre-presidency episodes will likely be longer than other episodes in the series, especially for historical figures such as George Washington, where there is so much material to work with. I'll try to keep the other episodes around 15 to 20 minutes, but for these episodes, please bear with me for a longer period, as I think they are important to helping us to understand the individual who assumes the presidency and what he brings to the office, both strengths and weaknesses. On the other extreme, there is no way to cover every facet of someone's life leading up to the presidency. I intend to hit the high marks of what you'll need to know moving forward and make recommendations, both in my work cited on the blog at presidencies.blueberry, that's B-L-U-B-R-R-Y dot com, and in the narrative of other resources that you can turn to for more information. For Washington thus far, the most in-depth and well-written Washington biography that I've read is Ron Chernow's Washington A Life, which came out a few years back. That's not to disparage other Washington scholars, as there are tons of books about Washington that come out each year, and I haven't read every one. But for me, Chernow's biography provided a great amount of information in such a way as to be informative and entertaining, which is what I strive to do whenever I speak about history. Should you have any recommendations for other Washington books that would be good to pick up, please feel free to comment on the blog or shoot me a message via email at presidenciespodcast, all one word, at gmail.com, on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash presidencies, or on Twitter at presidencies89. With all of that said, let's delve into the life of General Washington. George Washington was born at Pope's Creek in Westmoreland County, Virginia, around 10 a.m. on February 11, 1732. He was of the third generation of Washingtons to be born in the New World in a family that was slowly but surely making its way up the ladder of Virginia society. Washington biographer Ron Chernow describes Washington's father, Augustine Washington, as, quote, a shadowy figure in the family saga, little more than a hazy but sunlit memory for his famous son. A strapping man, six feet tall with a fair complexion, he was favored with that brand of rustic strength that breeds backwoods legends. He had had three children, Lawrence, Augustine Jr., and Jane with his first wife, then after her death, married George's mother, Mary Johnson Ball, in 1731. Mary was described as, quote, a pious, headstrong woman who would exert a profound formative influence on her son George. George would be the first, but not the last child, born to Augustine and Mary, and was soon joined by Betty, Samuel, John Augustine, Charles, and Mildred. Only two of the nine Washington children would end up dying in childhood, which was rather remarkable in a time of extremely high child mortality rates. When George was three, the family would move to a place that would become the center of his world as he grew older. His great-grandfather, upon coming to Virginia, built an estate on the banks of the Potomac River at Little Hunting Creek that ultimately grew to 5,000 acres. Augustine Washington moved his growing family to this estate and built a house, quote, with four ground floor rooms bisected by a central hallway and warmed by four fireplaces. A row of smaller bedrooms upstairs accommodated the growing clan. So sturdy was the new house that its downstairs rooms were later embedded into George's expanding mansion at Mount Vernon, turning the building into an archaeological record of his life. They would only remain there for a few years before Augustine moved the family again in 1738 to a 260-acre estate across from Fredericksburg on the Rappahannock River that would become known as Ferry Farm. His father would die at the age of 49 a couple of months after Washington's 11th birthday in 1743. Augustine's relatively early death further reinforced family lore that the Washington men were by constitution not long-lived. With more immediate impact, this event would go far to shape the young Washington's future in the next few years. With his father's absence and a time in his life that was seen in Virginian society, especially in the upper echelons, as being a time where a father should play a key role in educating his sons and help them, quote, to master the extensive code of manners that govern social relationships. George would have been at a disadvantage had this not been around the time that his older half-brother Lawrence was settling down and stepped in to act as a surrogate father. Lawrence had traveled to the Caribbean and South America as an officer in a colonial army supplementing British troops fighting Spain and had returned home to be elected to the House of Burgesses and, in 1743, married into the prominent Fairfax family. With their father's death, 
Lawrence inherited the estate at Little Hunting Creek and made it his home, likely in part because of the close proximity to the Fairfax estate, Belvoir, which was four miles downriver. It was Lawrence who had named the house Mount Vernon, after the British officer under which he had served, and he gave his half-brother George an open invitation to visit, which George took him up on as often as his mother would allow. History is the greatest adventure story, but does it ever leave you wondering what the women were doing all that time? This is Lori from the Her Half of History podcast, and the answer is that some women were seizing power, or escaping slavery, or spying for their country, or creating artistic masterpieces, while countless others were doing the laundry, getting married, and wondering why their clothes don't have more pockets. If you would like to hear the stories of women doing all of those things, check out Her Half of History at herhalfofhistory.com or wherever you get your podcasts. His time at Mount Vernon would afford him not just of his brother's influence, but that of the Fairfaxes, especially Colonel William Fairfax and his son, George William Fairfax. Chernow describes the relationship as follows, quote, The Fairfax connection opened up a world of extraordinary magnificence for young Washington, who must have felt a rough country bumpkin in comparison. His amazing career would never have unfolded had his fortunes not meshed so neatly with the interests of this ruling clan. The Fairfax family, owning a tract of land known as the Fairfax Proprietary, composed of over 5 million acres from the northern neck to beyond the Allegheny Mountains, had been a force in Virginia since the latter half of the 17th century. As George did not have the financial means for a formal education, he taught himself surveying and got his first big break in Colonel Fairfax hiring him to survey Fairfax lands in the Shenandoah Valley which George and his friend, George William Fairfax, ventured into in the spring of 1748. This would be George's first encounter with the wilds of the western frontier, but far from the last. Over the next two years, due to his brother's influence and his growing reputation, George would help survey what became the city of Alexandria, as well as various tracts in the Shenandoah Valley, and was named as the surveyor of Culpeper County, the youngest official surveyor in Virginia history to that point. Though it seems that, so far as our records show, he only completed one survey in the county. His career would be interrupted by the ill health of his brother Lawrence, who was suffering from what seems to be tuberculosis. Lawrence had traveled to England, and upon his return, he and George traveled to western Virginia to take in warm springs, which were said to have restorative powers, but which did Lawrence little good. Then Lawrence decided to travel to Barbados, as the tropical warmth was said to be good for health. And, as Lawrence's wife had just given birth, George decided to accompany his brother. The trip would be Washington's only trip outside of what would ultimately become the United States. However, he would only be there a couple of weeks before he fell ill with a mild case of smallpox, which, though a burden at the time, would be to his benefit, as noted by Chernow as, quote, furnishing him with immunity to the most virulent scourge of 18th century armies. George would survive, but his brother would not for much longer. After attempting a final search for a restorative treatment in Bermuda, Lawrence Washington would return to Mount Vernon, where he would die on July 26, 1752, at the age of 34. He would become, in Washington's mind, yet another example that the men of his family would not last long in life. As Washington was coming to terms with the death of his surrogate father, European politics were conspiring to forever alter the course of Washington's life as well as that of all of the inhabitants of North America. At this point in history, the continent was controlled, in some places more nominally than others, predominantly by various Native American cultures, but their power was being increasingly threatened by the prevalent European colonial powers of Britain, France, and Spain. Moreover, the European conflicts were being carried over to the New World, where the colonies they had established were seen as pawns in a larger chess game, where each side was seeking domination over the others. France and Britain were emerging as the larger players, and had, since 1689, already fought three wars described by historian Fred Anderson as, quote, typical European conflicts of the 18th century, limited, bloody, expensive, indecisive affairs, that ended not in great conquest, but the belligerents' mutual exhaustion and a restoration of the balance of power. The last war, concluded in 1748 with the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle, had technically ended with the status quo antebellum, or as it all was before the war. But in terms of power politics, France had come out stronger, while the British colonists on the eastern seaboard of North America were feeling in a vulnerable position. 
They wanted to expand into the interior, but found their way blocked by the British, who were exerting their influence in the Ohio Valley. Prior to his death, Lawrence Washington, along with Thomas Lord Fairfax and Colonel William Fairfax, had formed a land venture that they called the Ohio Company, through which they aimed to buy frontier land west of the Allegheny Mountains and develop it for settlement, with their focal point being the forks of the Ohio, the point where the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers came together to form the Ohio River. The British government had granted the land to the company, but the French, who felt that the territory was theirs, refused to recognize the grant, and instead made moves to construct a series of forts between Lake Erie and the Ohio River, which would help to solidify their claim. After all, might made right in the 18th century power game. To that end, the Lieutenant Governor of Virginia, Robert Dinwiddie, received permission from the British government to build forts of their own in the Ohio country ahead of the French. He was also empowered to send a special envoy to the French to order them to leave the land as it was the property of Great Britain. Once he heard of this, George Washington got himself to Williamsburg toot sweet and managed to convince the powers that be to appoint him to be that envoy. This 21-year-old Washington was empowered by none other than King George II himself to not just tell the French to get off the king's land, but also, if they didn't comply with the order, Quote, we do hereby strictly charge and command you to drive them off by force of arms. With those words, George Washington was given the authority to start the Fourth Anglo-French War. If you'll indulge me, I'd like to pause here for just a second. I promise not to tarry long as I realize that we've still got a good bit of ground to cover and we're not even into the French and Indian War yet, but I think this is an important time to reflect. At the age of 21, George Washington has dealt with the deaths of numerous family members, had begun a process of self-education that would continue on through his life as he took on new roles, had ventured into what was then the wilderness, and taken a journey by sea to Barbados at a time when most folks in the colonies didn't go further than a few miles from their home, and now had been given authority to take a course of action that could potentially plunge all of the British colonists and potentially the whole of Europe into war. Let me stress again, he's 21 at this point. It's hard for most of us to imagine having these types of experiences and responsibilities thrust on us when we were 21, and especially in the case of his position as a special envoy to actively seek it out. Most of us at the age of 21 are struggling to figure out how to make ends meet, or finish up papers for class, or recovering from hangovers, whatever the case may be, while Washington was on his way to a showdown with French military and colonial authorities. I believe, and I think a number of Washington scholars would agree, that there was something unique about this young man. John Furling, in his book, The Ascent of George Washington, The Hidden Political Genius of an American Icon, describes it best when he wrote that, quote, In the seven years since he had first met Lawrence and visited Mount Vernon, Washington had taken giant steps to overcome the obscurity he had feared would be his destiny. His early ascent had not just happened. His diligence and industry were important, and the excellent connections that he enjoyed, and which he no doubt cultivated assiduously, were crucial. But his patrons had not gone to bat for him solely because of family ties and kindness. Young Washington was conspicuous. He was physically imposing. Leaving nothing to chance, Washington had sought to cultivate those qualities that might turn heads. He made an early habit of standing ramrod straight, dressed well and fashionably, and learned to look others in the eye when speaking to them. Washington was not handsome, but he was striking, formidably so. He exuded ruggedness, and perhaps a slightly intimidating air, though there was sufficient polish to his demeanor that he struck many as at once engaging and composed and dignified. By his 21st birthday, Washington had also gained some experience in leading others, having already commanded considerably older men who constituted the surveying parties that he took to the frontier. As Washington made the transition from adolescence to adulthood, he must have struck his benefactors as ambitious, intelligent, eager to succeed, and willing to work hard. All in all, he was a polite young man who displayed charm as well as strength, tenacity, sturdiness, and vigor. He was what people sometimes refer to as a born leader, though in reality, Washington was not born this way. He had taken what nature had given him, and through observation, self-scrutiny, thoughtfulness, perseverance, and industry, 
reached a point that others saw him as a potential leader. Now that we hopefully have a better sense of the Washington that was appointed as Special Envoy, let's continue on with our narrative. And I assure you that we won't be as detailed in some of his later story, but I think it is crucial to understand Washington's formative years and the man that he became in order to understand the president that he became. Washington and his party headed up to the Yugiohaney River and went down to the Monongahela and the Ohio Rivers. He was able to gather intelligence as well as survey the forks of the Ohio, which he remarked was, quote, extremely well designed for water carriage, and that a fort at that location would have, quote, the entire command of the Monongahela. They arrived at the French fort, Fort Leboeuf, on December 11th after going through a snowstorm to get there. Washington reads Dinwiddie's letter to the French, and the French in turn draft a reply that basically says, you and what army is going to remove us? And Washington goes back to Williamsburg, where he delivers a verbal and written report. Washington is then elevated to lieutenant colonel and sent with a force to establish a fort on the forks of the Ohio. However, the French had beaten him to the task. Fort Euskane was already in the works. Thus, Washington and his force proceeded to the area where they could survey the situation, await new orders, and work to build support with local native tribes. Washington apparently started calling himself Kenoda Cucarius, a name that had been given to him by the chief of the Seneca Indians during a meeting the previous fall. The name meant Devourer of Villages, which is a rather lofty nickname for a green around the ears lieutenant colonel. Apparently the name didn't scare the French, who Washington soon discovered was sending a force his way. Though his instructions had clearly stated to, quote, act on the defensive, Washington decided to show initiative and instead attack first. He convinced the Senecas to join in the attack, and on the morning of May 28th, their combined force took the French under the command of the Sieur de Jumonville by surprise, and 12 French soldiers were killed in the initial attack, while others, including Jumonville, were wounded. It was then that things went really downhill as the Senecas proceeded to kill the rest of the French soldiers, with the chief himself cracking open Jumonville's skull. Once Washington recovered from his temporary paralysis of the sight, he started going through the papers he found on the lifeless Jumonville. It turns out that the French force was not coming after them to attack, but rather to deliver a message. Oops. Washington realized that he needed to go back to the original plan of defense, and fast, as news of the attack would likely reach Fort Duquesne sooner rather than later. Thus, Washington had his men construct a, quote, small circular stockade at Great Meadows, which he called, rather appropriately, Fort Necessity. It may have been shelter, but a good defensive position it was not. When the French forces under Louis Coulon de Villiers, otherwise known as the brother of Jumonville, arrived on july third the thick forest and high ground that surrounded fort necessity gave them a huge advantage and since they had found the bodies of their fallen comrades on the way they were itching for a fight with his forces having suffered a hundred casualties to the five french casualties in the engagement washington surrendered the next day and the french showed much more mercy than had been shown jumonville and his forces as washington and his troops were allowed to return to virginia only on the conditions that two hostages be left, and that Washington wrote a letter confessing to the murder of Jumonville, which he quickly did before hightailing it out of there. This document would be used against him once he got back to Virginia, but Washington would defend himself by throwing his translator under the bus. As his translator, quote, was a Dutchman little acquainted with the English tongue, Washington assured everyone that he hadn't really meant to admit to killing Jumonville. It was also convenient that the translator was one of the two hostages that had been left behind and wasn't able to tell his side of the story. It didn't stop the criticism, though. The French commander of forces in North America, General Duskine, said of Washington that, quote, He lies very much to justify the assassination of Sieur de Jumonville, which has turned on him, and which he had the stupidity to confess in his capitulation. There is nothing more unworthy and lower and even blacker than the sentiments and the way of thinking of this Washington. Even the governor of the neighboring colony of Maryland got in on heaping criticism on Washington by publishing his criticisms of Washington's leadership at Fort Necessity. The Virginia House of Burgesses, 
while recognizing Washington and other officers, quote, for their late gallant and brave behavior in the defense of their country, also voted not to raise new taxes to keep the Virginia regiment together. And, as a consequence, Washington was demoted to a lower rank, as he would now be part of an independent militia company, rather than the full regiment. He wrote to his brother, quote, What did I get by this? Why, after putting myself to a considerable expense in equipment and providing necessaries for the campaign, I went out, was soundly beaten, lost them all, came in, and had my commission taken from me. It was the last straw, and Washington resigned in November 1754 and returned to Mount Vernon. He had leased the estate from his brother's widow, but instead of applying himself to the life of a planner, he kept returning in his mind to military matters. Thus, he wrote in March 1755 to the chief of staff of the new British commander who had been sent to capture Fort Duquesne, General Edward Braddock, with Washington asserting that, quote, I wish earnestly to attain some knowledge of the military profession, and that, quote, a more favorable opportunity cannot offer than to serve under a gentleman of General Braddock's abilities and experience. Indeed, by this point, Braddock had 35 years under his belt in the British military, and Washington was able to secure a position as an aide-de-camp, joining Braddock and his forces at Frederick, Maryland in early May 1755. However, the education that Braddock would provide the young Virginian was more of a manual of what not to do. The conditions in North America were much different than the European conflicts in which Braddock had previously experienced, mainly because of the terrain. Whereas troops could move across Europe on paths that had been in place for centuries, Braddock and his forces would have to build their own road over a hundred miles long to Fort Duquesne. Washington wrote to his brother in June that the forces, quote, were halting to level every molehill and to erect bridges over every brook, by which means we were four days getting twelve miles. Washington proposed to the general that a flying column of 1,200 troops be broken off from the main force and sent at full speed for the fort, to which Braddock agreed. They would never make it to the fort, however. On July 9th, a French reconnaissance force of 900 soldiers discovered Braddock's column at the edge of a clearing and positioned themselves in the forest around the clearing. Once they had formed a semicircle around the British troops, they opened fire. To make a bad situation worse, the Virginia troops that had joined Braddock's forces rushed into the forest to take on the British head-on, but instead ended up getting mowed down by friendly fire from the British that were still in the clearing. Not expecting heroism from his troops that he wasn't giving himself, Braddock rushed headlong into the melee and ended up going down with chest and shoulder wounds. Though shot at, Washington stepped in, rallied the troops, and bid a hasty retreat. The conflict was a massacre for the British forces, with over 900 killed. Braddock himself died three days later. The French and their native allies only suffered 23 deaths and 16 injured from the engagement. The defeat would, however, do wonders for Washington's reputation. As folks talked about his clear-headedness in bringing order out of chaos after Braddock went down, Washington would gain the nickname of, quote, the hero of the Monongahela and a contemporary newspaper account described his, quote, high reputation for military skill, integrity, and valor, though success had not always attended his undertakings. Washington would continue on in a military role with the Virginia Regiment for a few years, beginning in August 1755, but after the site of Fort Duquesne was finally occupied by General John Forbes, Washington, and the forces under their command, on November 24, 1758, without a fight, Indeed, the French had burned the fort and abandoned the site after learning of the approach of British forces and realizing that they were outnumbered. Washington decided to turn his attention to other affairs and resigned his commission as Colonel of the Virginia Regiment in Williamsburg on Christmas. For Washington, the war had been an education in military operations and management, and the impact that it had on his future success in life cannot be understated. However, it had an even larger impact on the North American colonies and their relationship with Europe. As stated by historian Fred Anderson, quote, Unlike every prior 18th century European conflict, the Seven Years' War ended with the decisive defeat of one belligerent and a dramatic rearrangement of the balance of power in Europe and North America alike. In destroying the North American Empire of France, the war created a desire for revenge that would drive French foreign policy and thereby shape European affairs for two decades.
At the same time, the scope of Britain's victory enlarged its American domains to a size that would have been difficult for any European metropolis to control, even under the best of circumstances, and the war created circumstances of the least favorable sort for Whitehall. Without the Seven Years' War, American independence would surely have been long delayed and achieved, if at all, without a war of national liberation. But let's turn back to Washington for the moment, as he makes a personal achievement in his marriage to Martha Dandridge Custis. The woman who had become Mrs. Washington was described by Washington biographer James Thomas Flexner as follows, quote, She preserved simple manners, uninsistent dignity. She was not given to startling ideas or brilliant talk. Her intelligence and imagination ran to relations with other people. Down the long years, when her husband was so often embattled, no man or woman ever wrote of her with enmity. She preferred appreciative friendship to all. Like George, Martha's family had been in Virginia for a while, going back four generations, and were well established in the colony's planter class. However, Martha's first marriage would find her bucking social conventions. While well established, the Dandridges were not in the upper tier of Virginia society. Martha's suitor, Daniel Custis, however, couldn't go any higher. His father was one of the richest men in Virginia and threw a fit when he heard about his son's intentions to marry. He felt that Martha was not good enough for his son and was the 18th century equivalent of a gold digger. Finally, though, after months of persistence, including Martha braving a one-on-one -on -one visit with John Custis, where it seemed she made a good impression, Custis finally agreed to the marriage, and Daniel and Martha were married on May 15, 1750. As our focus is on Washington, I won't go into the Custis marriage in much detail, but if you'd like to learn more about Martha's early days, as well as her first marriage, I recommend Patricia Brady's Martha Washington and American Life as a good, informative read. For our part, the most important products of the Custis marriage were Martha's two children who survived early childhood, John Park Custis, known to the family as Jackie, and Martha Park Custis, who took on her mother's nickname of Patsy. Both Jackie and his father would fall ill on July 4, 1757, but though Jackie would survive, Daniel Custis died on July 8 and left Martha as a wealthy widow, which also made her one of the most eligible women in the colony, and, as it was expected for young widows to remarry, she soon began to entertain suitors. By March 1758, it seems that the field was narrowed to two. Charles Carter, who, like Martha's late husband, came from a prosperous and well-connected Virginia family, and our very own Colonel Washington. Washington, however, was not coming into this courtship having no romantic past at all. Indeed, around the same time, he had engaged in a brief flirtation with a married woman, the wife of his friend and neighbor, George William Fairfax. There is no definitive proof that the relationship ever became physical, but it does seem without doubt that there were some emotional entanglements involved, with the two even exchanging letters during his courtship and engagement to Martha. However, when the two married on January 6, 1759, from all that we know, George never strayed from his commitment to Martha. Likewise, this time in his life would see the full development of Washington's lifelong commitment to his estate, Mount Vernon. While serving in the Virginia Regiment, he had also been purchasing land to expand the estate, as well as ordering books to learn about the latest agricultural techniques. As with most Virginia planters, Washington originally focused his attention and energy on tobacco production. However, after four years of a decline in tobacco sales, he came to realize that not only did tobacco production depreciate the quality of the soil in any condition, his estate, due to its clay soil, could never hope to compete with tobacco being grown in southern Virginia. Thus, he utilized the knowledge gained from British agricultural books to implement changes to his farming practices. Quote, By 1760, Washington was already implementing Jethro Tull's horse hoeing techniques and cross plowing. He also conducted compost experiments with oats and barley using river mud, horse dung, cow dung, marl, sheep dung, black mold, and clay. He began to diversify his crops to grow wheat, hemp, flax, alfalfa, buckwheat, and corn, ultimately moving away from tobacco production altogether. He also started a fishing operation in the Potomac River and began, quote, a small cloth manufacturing business at Mount Vernon in the late 1760s. It should be noted 
that none of his business ventures would have been possible if not for the labor of the enslaved people that formed the backbone of the Mount Vernon estate. During the first year of marriage, Washington purchased 13 slaves and had 56 slaves of working age by 1761. At the time of the Revolution, he had 135 slaves employed in various forms of labor. Though by comparison, he was a more compassionate owner than some of his contemporaries by placing particular emphasis on slaves suffering from illness, taking careful heed to not break up slave families, and declining to buy new slaves after 1772. Nothing can excuse the fact that he retained ownership of human beings to labor for his personal benefit for the remainder of his life. Further, when his slaves ran away, he actively sought to recapture them. Like other slave owners, Washington would place advertisements in newspapers with as many details as possible in order to aid in their return to captivity. He may not have treated them as harshly as other plantation owners, but he also saw them as his property to be used or released according to his will. This will not be the last time that we will talk about slavery, either with Washington or with some of his successors. Though Mount Vernon was a key part of his life, he wasn't just a planner at this point. Just prior to his leaving the army, Washington had been elected to the Virginia House of Burgesses, and he attended his first session a few days after his wedding. He began his legislative career with his fellow Burgesses voting for a resolution in his honor to thank, quote, the late colonel of the 1st Virginia Regiment for his faithful services to his majesty and this colony, and for his brave and steady behavior. He found himself assigned to the Committee of Propositions and Grievances, a sought-after committee position, but despite this prominent start, Washington would do little to distinguish himself in the assembly during his 16 years of service. It seems that, for Washington, having a seat in the assembly was more about ensuring his position in society rather than an ambition to be a leader in the body. He was much more focused on attaining financial stability and prosperity. Events, though, would conspire to take him away from Mount Vernon and Virginia. As noted earlier, the conclusion of the French and Indian War brought changes to the world of the colonists of North America, one of which was the establishment of the Proclamation Line of 1763. The proclamation forbid British colonists from settling west of the Appalachian Mountains in an attempt to forestall conflict with the native peoples of the area. Washington, like many Virginians, saw speculation in lands in the West as, quote, the ideal vehicle for amassing riches and a way to invest in his own future and that of the country. And plans for land speculation in the Ohio country had been in place for nearly 20 years by investors in the Ohio Company of Virginia. And in 1763, Washington joined with other investors in a new land venture under the Mississippi Company that aimed to acquire title to 4,000 square miles are 2.5 million acres of land. As Fred Anderson wrote about the aftermath of the French and Indian War, quote, the issue of Western land speculation lay like a tripwire ahead, waiting to trigger an explosion that could injure not grubby squatters and half-savage hunters, but elite figures, gentlemen whose political connections extended into the Privy Council itself. Partnerships of investors like the Ohio Company could hardly be expected to abandon their plans to profit from the West, and their well-placed connections in the British government posed political issues back in London. However, this would not be the only crack in the established order, and the complications ultimately multiplied and piled together to lead to events that would forever reshape both North America and the world. As eloquently written at the beginning of Bruce Lancaster's study of the American Revolution, quote, In the dawn of 1764, the world was spinning its way through a seeming eternity of feudalism. And yet, under the surface, the oil of feudalism, which kept the world of 1764 turning so smoothly on its axis, was being slowly drained off. There were the liberal inquiring encyclopedists of Louis XV's France and their influence was spreading into southern Germany. There were powerful forces at work in England that would struggle unceasingly against the encroachments of the crown, but the largest and least suspected leak in the world supply of feudal lubricant lay far across the Atlantic. I had originally intended to do the pre-presidency as one episode, 
But as Washington was such a pivotal figure in the lead-up to the establishment of the presidency and in events that form the foundation of the stories of a number of his immediate successors, I think it's justified to have a two-part pre-presidency episode. As I said in the intro to the series, this format is an experiment for me as well, but hopefully you're finding this informative enough to continue on this journey. Please feel free to send your questions or thoughts to me via email at presidenciespodcast, all one word, at gmail.com on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash presidencies, or on Twitter at presidencies89. Show notes are available on the blog at presidencies.blueberry, that's blueberry without the e's, dot com. And this podcast is available on both iTunes and Stitcher, if you're not listening from there already. Thank you so much, and please join me for the next episode, where we'll go through the Revolution, the Constitutional Convention, and the election of Washington as the first president of the United States. Until then, take care, everyone. History is complicated. The story of human progress is long, messy, and riddled with controversies big and small. On Conflicted, we dive headfirst into history's most infamous events and contentious figures. We try and untangle the good from the bad, the fact from the fiction, and the monsters from the misunderstood. Was Genghis Khan a murderous butcher or a civic pioneer? Did the Allied powers go too far in firebombing the German city of Dresden at the twilight of World War II? And how did the Marquis de Sade acquire such a sinister reputation? And was any of it true? These are just a few of the tough questions we wrestle with and investigate on Conflicted. So if you love history or just enjoy a good story, please join me, your host, Zach Cornwell, for a fascinating new topic each and every month. Conflicted, a history podcast, is available on Spotify, Apple, or wherever else you get your podcasts. I hope to see you soon.